Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced, and again, if you've been enjoying all these videos on data concepts and practices, do, well, like and subscribe and leave a comment and um, make sure to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. But with that, what I want to do is today is talk about Apache Iceberg. What is Apache Iceberg? And on that note, if you want to learn a lot more about Apache Iceberg, uh, what I recommend you do is that you pre-order the book that I'm a co-author on. Okay, so if you head over to Amazon and you look up Apache Iceberg, the definitive guide, here it is. Okay, so yeah, pre-order it. Um, that would be much appreciated. Really cool to see how many uh, pre-orders we can see before um, yeah, it's release later uh, next year. Okay, but uh, it was a pretty exciting project. But as you can see, I talk a lot about uh, Apache Iceberg. And I've written a lot about Apache Iceberg. So it's a topic that I care about quite a bit. So now that we've established that, let's talk about what is Apache Iceberg. And to really appreciate it, you have to understand sort of where we've been. Okay, so essentially what happens is that typically, first let's just kind of summarize the, the typical story. So you have your data sources. Okay, then you'd move them over to your what's called a data lake, which is essentially some sort of distributed uh, storage system, so an HDFS or uh, object storage. And then you would probably take some of that data and send it over to a data warehouse. Okay. So that is what you would typically do. And, you know, your BI dashboard and your porting would probably be powered off your data warehouse. You do some ad hoc analytics and AI ML work off your data lake. Um, but the problem is oftentimes the data lake wasn't the easiest place to work with because it's just basically a dumping ground. Doesn't really have like the same sort of like UI and nice wrapper that a database and a data warehouse has. So the always the idea was how can we take the data lake and treat it more like a database? And so the first foray into that was Hive. Okay, Hive allowed you the right SQL that would get translated into MapReduce jobs to run in Hadoop. Okay, and for Hive to do that, to write SQL, you need to know what a table is. So I had to come up with some sort of way to define what is the data set that I'm running this SQL on. And the way it did that is through a, a directory uh, structure. So I would say, hey, you know what? Um, this folder here, This folder here, so we'll say, hey, this is a folder called table A. That's the table. Okay, and then inside of it, you may have like partition folders. Okay, and this would be maybe a slash like age equals 18, you know, in case you're partitioning by age. And again, partitioning just means that we're going to physically separate certain data that has a similar characteristic. So in this case, if we're partitioning the table by age, that means all the records that have the age of 18 are in parquet files in this folder or in files in this folder and so forth. So 19 and essentially, but notice we're not listing any individual files. Okay. So what happened is that the query engine, okay, would have to go once it says, Hey, I want you to scan table a, it knows, Hey, table a is this folder. And these are the subfolders, the partitions got it, but it would still have to do file listing operations. So I would still have to go to this folder here to generate a list of all the files in that folder and then read each file individually. Okay. To read to scan that partition. So at best, what I could do is I could say, Hey, give me information for all the students who are 19 and it would only scan this partition, but that's about as good as it got. Okay, I could I could I could take advantage of partitioning, um, but I would still end up having to read all the data in that partition. Okay, and even worse, if I wanted to like write the data, okay, and you wanted to have like some sort of atomic transaction, so basically update, you know, an all or nothing update. What would happen is at first what you would do is you would rewrite. So first you would separately write, rewrite that whole partition. So I would rewrite that whole partition over here. And then I would do an atomic swap. So this is thing called the Hive Metastore. Okay, and the Hive Metastore would track which folders were part of the table. So essentially what would happen is that we the Hive Metastore would be pointing to this as the table and these as the partitions of that table. 
And then to do an atomic swap, we'd separately rewrite the entire partition and then just go to the Metastore and say, okay, going forward, this partition is now represented by this folder. And then we can go back and delete this one. Okay. But you can see like that's, what if I'm only updating one row? I'm still updating the whole partition. So you can see here that it could be slow because we have to do all those file listing operations, kind of slow to do updates or tricky to do updates. And if I wanted to update multiple partitions, it'd have to do be across multiple part, uh, transactions, not one single atomic transaction. So there was just like a lot of imperfections here. It was a lot better than nothing, which is what came before, but still not quite better. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that the unit of account here was a folder. So flash forward, we try the story again. Okay, and we say, okay, hey, here's table A. Okay, here's table A. And table A, instead of it being a bunch of folders, what it is, it's a bunch of files. Okay. So instead of it being a folder of a thousand files, every individual file is individually tracked. Okay. And basically what's going to happen, it doesn't matter where these files could be in folders. It doesn't matter. Like the actual structure of how they're physically organized doesn't matter. What's going to happen is that on the side here, we are going to have metadata. Okay. And this metadata is going to have information sort of like, you know, file statistics. Okay. Uh, schema, partitioning rules, all sorts of information about this table. So using this metadata, I can go in here and identify, Hey, I only really need to scan this file right here. Okay. Maybe that's the only file I need to scan. And I didn't even have to scan the files. I didn't have to do any file listing, just purely based on the metadata, the side structure of data. I can go identify the files I want to scan. Or if I want to update it, I know that the record I want to update is right here in this file. So in that case, that's the only file I need to swap. So I would then write the new file and then that file, then this file gets added to the table and this file would get you no know, be no longer part of the table. Okay. So that's much, 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 much less intense than before when we were talking about whole folders of files. Okay, so this approach was a lot faster. So it's going to allow for much more faster reading of the table, more faster updating of the table, safer updating of the table. Um, and this this type of technology, so this type of like metadata layer, because really at the end of the day, all it is, these are just parquet files. Okay, same thing here. Like the, the data files are the data files. But what's making the difference is the way we track what's part of the table. So in here, what we're doing is we have a metadata layer. So here we had a metadata store that only tracked the folders. Here we're going to have metadata files that track the individual files. And that's referred to as a table format. So either one's a table format, but a table format, a modern table format tracks the files. And an example of that kind of table format is Apache Iceberg, which came out of Netflix. Okay, so Netflix was where this originated at because they were trying to deal with these problems that you saw in the high format. Okay. So essentially that was the thing they were trying to solve for. Okay. So we get it. Okay. If we have this metadata here, I can more efficiently scan these files. But again, depending on how you structure your metadata, that's also going to enable uh, certain things. And uh, Apache Iceberg was really, really clever in the way it structured its metadata. Okay. So essentially what happens is that you first start off with a separate sort of mechanism called the catalog. Now the catalog is not the metadata. The catalog just basically allows you to discover the metadata. Okay. So basically that basically this is just going to allow you to discover table metadata. Okay. So for example, we might list table a and right now there's nothing listed for table a. So we'll come back to that. So let's say I decide to create a table. Okay. Well, what would happen is that if we created a table. First thing that would happen is we would create a metadata.json file. So we, here we have v1 dot met v1 dot metadata dot json. Okay. And essentially this file would define like in this file, I would define like the schema, 
the partitioning, basically the definition of the table. Okay, but there's no files in the table yet because I just created the table, so there's nothing else. Okay, now let's say later on we decide, so right now, the table, when I take a look at the catalog, the minute we created the, the, the we create the table, the catalog gets updated and we say, hey, guess what? Table A, its current state is metadata.json. So if you wanna know how the table looks like right now, that's the file to go look at. Okay, now what's gonna happen is that later on, you might decide to insert some records. So what's gonna happen? We're gonna create some files. Okay. So we're gonna create some data files. So we'll rate whatever data files are needed. Okay. So we'll just say these three data files. And then what's gonna happen is that you need to create the list of those files. So these, and that's referred to as a manifest. Okay, so we'll create a manifest, which we'll do as purple. And we're gonna create these manifest files. Okay, we'll say we'll create two of them. Okay. And these manifest files are actually going to contain a list of data files. So this manifest will track these two files and it will contain all the stats on those files, like how many records are in those files, what val what are the range of values of those file of those records. So it'll have information on each file. Okay, and then this one's tracking that one. So there might be multiple manifests tracking all these files. So we need a, a way to know which manifests belong to the table right now. So in that case, what we create is a manifest list. Okay, a manifest list. Okay, and this is all, you can also think of this as a snapshot of the table. Basically, what this table looks like, all the different manifests that belong to this table at this point in time are tracked by this file. Okay, so we're gonna say, hey, these two manifests okay, are currently part of the table. This results in a new metadata.json going forward. So that becomes V2. And that's going to point to the current snapshot. Okay. And then we update the catalog. So we say, hey, going forward catalog, next time someone's looking for this table, don't point them to V1, point them to V2. Okay. So now if an engine wants to come in and read the table, Okay, and I say, hey, I would like to go query this table. The tool, which could be something like Dremio, like Apache Spark, they would first consult the catalog and say, hey, I'm looking for table A. And like the catalog's gonna come back and say, hey, table A, you can find the information in table A in this file, and it'll give you where to find that file. So then let's say Dremio would read this file, and in there it would learn how the table is partitioned, how what is the current scheme of the table, and where to find the current snapshot. So it would then point it to this file. This file would say, hey, these are the groups of files that belong to the table right now. Okay, and also have stats on those groups of files. So it would actually have manifest li li level stats being like, okay, hey, the files that are tracked by this manifest, they cover what range of values, they cover what partition values. So I can already say, hey, maybe this manifest I don't need to look at. So I can skip this manifest, but I do need to scan this manifest. Okay, so then it would go to the manifest and say, okay, taking a look at the information for each of these individual files, based on my query, I don't need this file, but I do need this file. And then it'll scan this actual file. So no files get scanned until it works its way through this layer of metadata. And at each layer, it can kind of whittle down what it's eventually going to have to read. So that way, at the end, you only have the most efficient list of files, like the, the narrowest list of files you need to scan to run your query. Okay. So now let's say we decide to delete a file. So I'm gonna delete, let's say we end up deleting all the records that belong in this file. Okay, so what would happen? In this case, all that would happen is since you're, you're not adding any new records, we're just deleting the records, a new, what would happen is a, actually technically you would just need a new manifest list in this case. Okay, no new data files are created except now in this manifest list, only this manifest is used because again, this file was deleted so this manifest is no longer needed because that was the only file it tracked. Okay. So, and in that case, a new meta.json is created and that's going to be V3. Okay. And that's going to end up pointing to this manifest as the current snapshot, but it'll also know that this is the previous snapshot. Okay. And then I update the catalog, say, Hey, going forward, someone asked for this table, point them to V3. Okay. 
So now if I were to send a query for like the current table, it would send it to metadata.json, send me to this manifest list, and only these files would get read. Because again, this manifest is no longer part of the table. But if I were to do what's called a time travel query and say, hey, you know what, don't query this snapshot. I really specifically want to query an older snapshot. It can still go in here and discover all three files to discover how the data of the table that used to be there. So I can discover, I can query the historical versions of the table. Okay, so that's called time travel. And that's very powerful because before you couldn't do that. Basically, once you updated the hive table, it was updated. That's it. So people would have to do what's called snapshotting, where they would have to create periodic copies of the entire table, set them to the side, so that way they can check in on the historical versions of the table. And if you're talking about terabyte or gigabyte size tables, I mean, that's using a lot of storage every time you make a copy, okay? Or even petabyte size tables. I mean, that's just not going to be feasible. So then what would happen is let's say we added some more records. Okay, so we do another insert, we insert some records. Okay, so then what happens? Okay, I create some more data files for this new insert. Okay, that gets tracked by another a new manifest. Okay, so that manifest is going to track these new files. Okay, then we create a new manifest list. And then we're gonna say, well, you know what? This manifest all the way over here is still part of the table. This one isn't, and this one is. So that's the current state of the table right now. And then those manifests can point to the individual files. Then we create a new v3 metadata.json that then points to the current manifest list as the current snapshot, but then also is aware of the older snapshots as well. So I can go query those older versions of the table as well. Okay, and again, this is going to become v4. And then we update the catalog to be v4. This catalog could be like a data, you could use like a database, like a Postgres, you could use a lot of custom implementations, Hive, uh, AWS Glue, Nessie. Uh, these are all things, all different technologies that can be used to be that tracker of that reference. Okay, but that's this is essentially how Iceberg works. It's basically, basically notice that by having the structure, we can reuse a lot of these pieces from one transaction to the next. I don't always have to write a new manifest. A lot of this data can be reused from snap to snapshot to snapshot, yet it's structured in a way that if an engine were to kind of drill down, it can first try to make big cuts to the number of files it needs to read and then make more granular surgical cuts when it gets to that manifest um, and start saying, hey, this file I don't need, this file I do need. And that's essentially what Iceberg does. It provides this metadata layer so that way engines can, one, make transactions. They can update, delete um, tables, but they are also going to be able to time travel tables and they'll be able to query them really fast. Okay. Iceberg alone will just make pretty much any tool to query your tables faster than it would be uh, without a table format like Iceberg because it's able to help you create a smarter query plan, meaning, hey, which files do I need to scan? Making it possible to actually start doing more of that work. So before, again, we were moving all that data to the data warehouse. It becomes more and more possible to do more of the work in the data warehouse, where we can now maybe get rid of the data warehouse. Okay. And basically stop using the data warehouse. And instead, our data lake becomes the center of our data world because we have a way to treat our data on the data lake like our data tables in a database. And that becomes more what's called a data lake house. So it's a technology like Iceberg that's a really big chunk of what allows your data lake to become a data lake house. Okay, so that's why Apache Iceberg matters. What is Apache Iceberg? Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. My name is Alex Merced. I'll see you all later.